685-4100. That's 685-4100. Quinn Rempe's deck. Drops him. This is Frankie the Answer, Edgar. Hey, this is Rashad Evans, and you listen to MMA Fight Corner. And here we go. This is a championship fight. This is MMA Fight Corner, live on Fox Sports Radio from Las Vegas, with your hosts, Billy Mira, Phil Devine, and Joey Varner. Hey, this is Mike Goldberg, voice of the Ultimate Fighting Championship, and you are listening to the MMA Fight Corner. Here we go! Here we go! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the MMA Fight Corner. We are live from Fox Sports Studio in Las Vegas and streaming worldwide on UFCradio.com. I'd like to take a minute and thank our sponsors, Dr. Richard Rothman of LASIK of Nevada. Give him a call today at 702-636-2010. Mention you heard this on MMA Fight Corner and receive an additional discount on your procedure. First of all, guys, I want to welcome uh, Phil Devine and Joey Varner here to the show. I am Heidi Fang. You guys right here? <laughs> yeah, those guys. And Armando behind the board. On our last show, we had a UFC lightweight, uh, Ryan Couture. He was in an exclusive interview with us. And we had special in-studio guest, Adam Sella from The Ultimate Fighter 17. And uh, he was talking about some of his true feelings that he had about uh, one of his castmates. We'll get to that in a second. But coming up a little later, we also have an interview with UFC featherweight, Marcus Brimage, the Bama Beast. He's taking on an Irish prospect, a hot up-and-comer in Conor McGregor at UFC on Fuel TV 9 that comes up next weekend on April 6. The featherweight division is totally on fire right now. There's been a lot of fight signings. Uh, UFC 160, those had a couple with uh, Bermudez and Holloway. Yep. That yeah. is going to be sick. Bermuda's and Holloway is going to be a scrap, dude. Holloway so long and lanky and just looking phenomenal his last outing. And Bermuda's coming off a fight of the year performance over Matt Grice. I think I'm going to smell another fight of the year candidate with those two going at it. Absolutely. I mean, every time I, I see Dennis Bermuda's go, he's, he's like a mini Sherman tank, dude. He's yeah. so fun to watch. That last fight he had with Grice, like you said, fight of the year candidate. I, hell, we can go fight of the decade candidate right now. That was, one of, that was just an amazing throwdown. That was a Rocky Four caliber fight where it was just one guy rocked almost out. He comes back, rocks the other guy. He's almost out. And I'll tell you what, it would be my clear-cut winner for fight of the year right now early on if it wasn't for the following weekend, Brian Stan and Vanderlei Silva taking place. Yeah, how, exactly. How could I forget that? Right? <laughs> also, um, that same card had another signing with the Bantamweights, George Roop versus the return of WEC Bantamweight champ Brian Bowles. Yeah, you know, I, I've always been a fan of Brian Bowles, and Roop, you know, he's... Uh, Kind of up and down in his career, doesn't have the greatest record, but he always goes in there and throw, puts on a show and bowls tough as nails. Uh, I'm looking forward to that fight. The whole card, actually, I know, and that's like one of the first fights on the card. Sick. Yeah, Sick. it's gonna be pretty awesome. Uh, but coming up, we do have a little bit of the interview that we had with Adam Sella. Again, he was a live in studio guest with us, and you know, we really didn't get a chance to touch on the all the Ultimate Fighter. Uh, quarterfinals that happened on Tuesday. So I wanted to get your take, Phil, on some of the fights that we saw that night with Dylan Andrews, Calvin Gastelum, the underdogs coming up huge. Absolutely. Dylan Andrews showed me something the other night that I, I, I was not expecting that. Uh, he looked tired and gassed leading into that third round. And when they showed the picture of his family and you saw the intensity that he came out of that corner with, that made me a fan right then and there. And Kelvin, how can you not like this guy? I mean, he's got the grappling. You see he's got the striking. Youngest competitor on the show's history. You got to root for the underdogs this season. And he's got that. Oh, go ahead. No, this is this is the season of the underdog, and we've seen it's been it's been the story time in and time out where the you know the last the last guy picked just comes from behind and gets the W, and we saw it here in this episode. Both fighters, both guys, last round, last picked, moving on to the semifinals. Awesome night. Both two huge knockouts. And Dylan, dude, when you started talking about that that when in, in between the third or the second and third round, when he saw that picture, dude, I got goosebumps because you could feel that. I had goosebumps when I was watching it, and when you just brought it up again, I got goosebumps again. Like, I wanted to get up and start. I was going to go over there and take out Armando. <laughs> <laughs> and the best part, I think, was the preview, you know, or not the best part, because the fights were the best fights we've seen on The Ultimate Fighter this season. Just back and forth action, great fights. But leading into the preview, when you see the, 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 fin the fights next week coming up this Tuesday, and you got Uriah Hall and Bubba McDaniels, and the way... Bubba was suffering from such anxiety in this preview. Like, I, I, I watched the, uh, the show with, uh, you know, a few people, and one of them's not the biggest MMA fan. You know, they watch the show, but they're not like they know everybody. 
he was like, dude, what kind of fighter is this? He's scared to fight? And I'm kind of looking at him, and I'm like, I, I don't want to fight Uriah Hall. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're like, hold on, let me replay the Adam Sell Uriah Hall fight so you just understand exactly what you, what he's in for. But but you could see that coming up right when the fight was announced because everyone thought the fights were going to go a certain way. They thought you know they knew who they were going to fight, and when it was down to Uriah and, and, and um. And Bubba, with Bubba, mm-hmm. yeah, you just saw Bubba like, like what? Uh, <laughs> I uh, liked his like, comment too. Uh, wait a second, they asked us who we wanted to fight, and at no point on my list was Uriah Hall. Guess what? He wasn't on anybody's list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and the thing with Bubba, I mean, I'm a chick, and I probably don't have a right to speak because I don't get there in there and tussle. But I'm looking at him, and I'm like, put on your big boy pants, dude. Come on, man up. Well, you know what's funny about that is. The previous episode where he fought and won the wild card, you know, his post-fight celebration was, was you know, so alpha male. Like, I will not be broke. You can't break me. No one can stop me. Ah, and now it's, <laughs> I got to fight Uriah? What type of crap is that, man? I think of the scene from Terminator at the end with Lyndall Hamilton, and she's yelling at uh, Reese, and she's like, get up, soldier! Yeah. Time to fight, soldier! <laughs> yeah, well, that's what he needs to do. It's that time to click that over with him. No doubt. But, you know, coming up, we were looking at something on the UFC's website. Phil had found this list of the 16 most bizarre moments in UFC history. We are going to touch a little bit on that. And what can you tell us about some of them that you saw in there? We definitely have to touch on some of them because some of them are absolutely amazing and would be right up there on my list. And I'm sure with Joey's too. But looking at it, I think there's some things that need to be added to it. Yeah, Phil and I were in in, in agreement. So once we pulled that up, we started rattling it off. We're like, well, where's this? Well, where's this? Well, where's this? Well, where's this? And so when we do get to it later on, we'll, we'll clue you all in into what we felt was missing from this list. What were a couple of those, maybe? If you could just give us a little preview of maybe the ones that stood out, not necessarily the ones that you didn't that you think should be there that aren't, but maybe a couple of the top two. That- well, so, something that was on there that is probably one of the key moments for me to be where I am a- as a fan of this sport was BJ Penn knocking out Kauno in 11 seconds back. I think it was UFC 32, whatever it yeah, was. It was one of the right. first ones that Zufa had taken over and knocked him out in 11 seconds, b- bowed every direction, and then pieced himself out of the cage and ran right into the back. And I was like, who is this beast? That was so, actually a fight that made me a fan of that, MMA. That is why I am the BJ Pan fan that I am, because of that fight. I thought you were going to say Just Bleed Guy. <laughs> you look you look like you could be related to Just Bleed Guy. I, I, I will admit, back in the day, I, I was a little bit of like the Just Bleed Guy when UFC first came around. <laughs> Well, guys, we uh, did have that interview with Adam Sella. I'd like to give the fans a little bit of a taste right now for that interview. Um, Joey, you had uh, discussed with him some, he had some choice words for one of the castmates on the Ultimate Fighter Season 17. Yeah, you know, during the season, we saw a couple times, of course, he was the recipient of the knockout herd around the world uh, delivered by Uriah Hall. And But Uriah Hall had some choice words for him, and Uriah Hall kind of painted himself as, as the odd man out, the standoff, the person that it seemed like no one really clicked with, and he he made the choice to not click with, with with anyone, and so we asked him. We wanted to know, hey, what was it like living with Uriah? You know, how was Uriah a, as a roommate, as a housemate, as a castmate? And and this is what he had to say. I don't know if I can say this, but Uriah is a dick. <laughs> I was gonna like, say that word, like, but I, I, I cut it out. I will be the first to say Uriah. Just he he, he was just a dick. I mean, nobody uh, nobody liked him um, on he his was, on his own team. I mean, and and you kind of see it. I don't know if they'll show it, but um. You know, those guys were telling us that nobody wants to train with him, nobody wants to spar with him, because he, he goes too hard. So, um, he, uh, you know, he, he just kind of, he doesn't know how to train, I think, as far as, like, in the show. I don't know how he's back home. But, um, you know, as far as, like, him saying stuff to me, this and that, outside of the gym, I don't think he understands joking. Like, he, he called me a bitch and something about my girlfriend, this and that. Do you have a girlfriend, by the way? No. So so that was just like left field. You didn't even have no, a girlfriend. I, I did, um, and we're kind of in a weird limbo thing. But uh, Ve- Ve- Vegas will do that to you. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I hear. <laughs> but uh, no, we had uh, we had they had set us up to go to the Red Rock Casino to uh, go bowling, and they showed that episode. And your you know Uriah came up, and what they don't show is the when Uriah walks up, he says, "Oh, I'll hang out with you guys." Although I only like Dylan and and Clint or something like that, and we're like. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of weird, but all right, whatever, dude. So we sit down, you know, we're all friendly, this and that, and then uh, we're going to the Red Rock, and he says, 
oh, I think we're going to the, I thought we were going to the Hard Rock. I was like, and it just as a joke, I was like, well, I guess you can go to the Hard Rock. We're all going to the Red Rock. And I guess that just set him off. Like he, and some stuff they don't show is uh, him and Colin kind of had some words. Um, he told, he, he looked Colin in the face, told him to F off. Like, he, he, he just rubbed everybody the wrong way. So, uh, I think, uh, as far as training, he looked at everybody as an opponent. Like, I know he went with Luke pretty hard a couple times and, uh, you know, he's like, oh, well, I may have to fight him. I want him to know, blah, 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 this and that. But as far as the, the Hooters thing, um, that was just him being, that was really just him being him. I mean, he, uh, he was always by himself. He never really came out of his room. Um, he would go run in the backyard and, and just, he was always by himself because nobody really wanted to be around him. He just said weird things and was just kind of awkward. Um, which it sucks because I kind of knew him from a kickboxing thing before. And, uh, Wait, so you knew him. Were you cool with him before the show? Acquaintances uh, <laughs> at least? Um, I would say I was an acquaintance of his, but we fought on this, uh, pro kickboxing league and he was on the New Jersey team. I was on the St. Louis Which team. The Chuck Norris. Uh, yeah. Okay. The World Combat League. Yeah, WCL. And, uh, when our teams fought each other, and I and, and I it didn't click until back home someone had mentioned it to me. Um, he started he started kind of like a, a bit of a, a fight there, oh, like really? on, on the side. Like everybody's fighting in the in the, the little circle thing, whatever it was. And he was jaw jacking with like our head coach, a couple of our uh, other fighters. Um, so then I, I and then when it clicked, I was like, okay, it makes sense. He's very confrontational. All right, guys, that was Adam Sella. And coming up after the break, we have a special exclusive interview with UFC on Fuel TV 9's UFC featherweight, Marcus Brimage. We'll talk some more about the UFC 160 card. You're listening to MMA Fight Corner, live from Fox Sports Radio in Las Vegas and worldwide on UFCradio.com. The MMA Fight Corner. The hottest in adult entertainment is just in Vegas, and it's only at the Rhino. The Spearman Rhino never cools down. Home to the longest happy hour known to man and 20,000 square feet of the sexiest ladies in the valley. The talented staff is always ready to entertain you. They're waiting for you. Step foot inside the Spearman Rhino and witness the most beautiful dancers in town. Locals are always free, and full bar and food are always available. Breakfast, lunch, or dinner. For a free limo pickup, call 796 36 the Spearman Rhino, 3340 South Highland Drive, nightly. The Rhino proves why they're the top adult nightclub in Vegas. So stop by and see what all the fuss is about today. Only in Las Vegas, only in the Spearman Rhino. The only gentleman's club to visit in Las Vegas. The Spearman Rhino, 3340 South Highland Drive. Stop by Spearman Rhino every day from 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. and take advantage of the $100 premium bottles. Some restrictions apply, including some special events. The world's fastest motorsport is returning to Las Vegas. Experience side-by-side -side racing so powerful that all five of your senses will melt into one at the SummerRacing.com NHRA Nationals. April 5th through 7th, you won't want to miss Brittany Force, daughter of 15-time world champion John Force, in her top fuel debut at the Strip at Las Vegas Motor Speedway. Bring the whole family. Kids 12 and under are free in general admission. Purchase in advance and save at LVMS.com or call 800-644-4444. Colin Cowherd here. Make sure you're taking care of yourself and your loved ones by getting your dental checkups regularly. My friends at Tender Dental are open seven days a week as well as evening to take care of all your dental needs. Emergency walk-ins, same-day appointments, no problem. Three convenient Tender Dental locations. They even have a full oral surgery and dental implant center. Tender Dental accepts most insurances and has payment plans too. Call Tender Dental today. 329-0828. The MMA Fight Corner. All right, welcome back into the MMA Fight Corner. Joining us right now in the Fight Corner, UFC featherweight Marcus Brimage, who will be introducing former Cage Warriors lightweight and featherweight champion Conor McGregor to the famed Octagon on April 6th in Stockholm, Sweden. Marcus, how you doing today? Oh, man, I'm feeling good. Just have to smoothie shot. Let's bring you off and throw us in the back corner. <laughs> so uh, tell us, you're going to Sweden. What are your thoughts on uh, fighting outside of the U.S.? Uh, very cold. You know, I'm in South Florida. It's kind of chilly here. And uh, I was told it's like 19 degrees in Stockholm, so I'm definitely not looking forward to that. Yeah, uh, yeah. what about the weight cut? Um, we've had some fighters on the air talk about how it's hard cutting weight in a foreign country that last week. What are your thoughts about that? Um. Well, I'm going to find out the hard way. I hope it's not. I hope it's all tall, but we'll see when I get there. You know, I got to get over the jet lag and all the other stuff. 
Yeah. Now, now Connor, a uh, lot of hype behind this guy. He's uh, he's never seen a judge's decision. Um, hell, he hasn't, he hasn't even seen the third round, if I'm if I'm correct. So, is that the plan to bra- drag him into deep water? Uh, the plan is to land by any means necessary. So, you know, if they, it goes through the fishing, it sucks, but it'll go through the fishing. If I knock, if I knock, knock his ass out in the first, I'll knock his ass out in the first. Because, you know, we don't get paid by the rounds in the UFC. <laughs> No, you don't. And you know what? It's funny because you're coming off a, a, the biggest win of your career a, a, over Jimmy Hedis. And, and Hedis was one of these guys who he was touted as the next big thing. He was 10-0. and He was tapping everyone out. I mean, he was this next huge, huge, hot prospect. And, and, and you derailed the hype train. And now here again, you find yourself in a similar situation where you've got this up-and-coming prospect, this, this hype train, you know, Conor McGregor, who's got a lot of steam coming into this fight. MTV did a mini-documentary about him um and now you're taking it on him again do you feel like you know this is going to be your new, new role it's you are the official hype train derailer well um i wouldn't even glorify myself like that it's just that the position i'm in in the ufc everyone thinks i suck so if i beat you you really suck because, <laughs> you know, I, I, they keep using me as a stepping stone i mean massimo blanco he was supposed to be on the fast track to aldo i stopped that just like you said with Jimmy Hedis, I stopped that. Now this guy. Now I'm about to stop that again. And like I said, they think I suck. They keep using that stepping stone. But if I keep beating you and I suck, that means you really suck, then. Now, you, you, for the third time in a row, you're taking on another southpaw. And I know, I know, know as a southpaw, you know, southpaws get used to facing orthodox fighters. And that's, um, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's almost for an orthodox fighter, the equivalent of facing another orthodox. You know, it's just what you get used to. You find what works. You know how to flow with it. You know the openings. You know how to create them. And for, for a lot of southpaws, fighting another southpaw can be very difficult because you, you don't see them that often. Just like when an orthodox fighter gets a southpaw, he doesn't see those southpaws that often. Um, so now moving forward, this is your third southpaw in in a row. Maximo Blanco was a southpaw. Jimmy Hattis was a southpaw. Dean Thomas and uh, Corey Spinks. That helps a lot. Yeah, that, those, that is not bad company to be keeping when you're going to a training camp. <laughs> mm-hmm. Marcus, I'm curious. Um, this fight, it took nearly seven months to book. I was just curious if there was any reason for the long delay in getting another fight. I, be honest with you, I don't know either because it, it felt like I was being punished for beating Jimmy Heather. It's like, you know, <laughs> I was like, yo, what's going on with this, you know? So... Uh, that was kind of shocking, but you know the time was uh, well spent because uh, I did a lot. I did a lot of training, you know. So all the time, all the months I had off, I did nothing but get better in the process. So I'm kind of happy I had that time off in order to read, uh, just to relearn my craft. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, of course. I've seen on Twitter that you're running every day, like five, six, seven miles. How important is that conditioning for you leading into this fight, being that you're going to be in Sweden and you don't know how that atmosphere might affect you? Oh, it's huge. It's, it's very huge. Um, the, the more conditioned you are, the more likely, the, the easier the fight is. You know, you train hard so you can fight easy. So yeah. I'm always up. I'm running. Um, I ain't got nothing to do now. I don't have a job besides, you know, training. So... I take full advantage of it. So if I'm not eating, sleeping, uh, playing uh, playing a video game, I'm training. So Ooh, video games. What do you play? Did you get Bioshock? So. No, I didn't get the new Infinite, but I have played all the rest of the Bioshock. Um, I just got the beating... Ah, what's the name of the game? I just got the... Oh, I beat Darksiders 2. Okay. Uh, I'm replaying Batman right now. Escape from uh, I got the new Assassin's That's Creed. Awesome. Oh, yeah, Assassin's Creed this is a pretty awesome one. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. on Conor McGregor getting back to the fight here, does this 12-2 and record mean anything to you? I mean, does that mean anything until you fought in the UFC despite the hype? Not really. Yeah. I mean, um, he's supposed to be this, he's supposed to be that. But, you know, if I went back and I watched this fight, and the guys were just scared of him. And it was bad. I don't even understand how you could be a fighter and be that scared of an opponent. 
Wait. In both his championship fights, he got hit four times. In both his championship fights. Who the hell was the champion? You know what I'm saying? I'm like, <laughs> how do you get hit four times and you're the ch- and you're the challenger taking the belt? You know what I'm saying? I I just don't understand that. It, it's like it's like it's like me going to Alabama State Fairgrounds, putting all my cousins in the stand and clowning some bombs. Like I could do that, but you know I I just don't don't see the people who you face. You know what I'm saying? Like I think they were all scared, and I'm not scared. So that's going to be a big difference for him to see. Do you attribute that to your military and your Muay Thai training that you've had in the past? That you're not scared of anything because you've been through that experience? Uh. Yeah, more more like my dad because uh, he talked about me and hurt my feelings at way more sense of age. So you know, nothing else bothers me right now. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think another factor that that played into the the performance of his previous opponents was the the element of the crowd? Or you know, Europe's like. 10 miles wide. I mean, it's a small country, so so you're almost going to be coming into hostile territories. You know, you're going to be walking uh-huh. into this guy's backyard, and just judging by the turnout in all his fights, you know, and, and how the Irish are, especially with one of their own, you know they're going to pack that, that stadium, so you might be facing a hostile crowd. Yeah, man, I, mean, I, I, I don't care about them. I don't think that's, <laughs> uh, all my mind is kind of McGregor, you know, and you know, after I whip, the, after I whip his ass, it's going to be then I'm going to start paying attention to the crowd because I might get jumped. So I might have to get my ass out there really quick. But other than that, I don't care about them guys. The only thing I'm worried about is Conor McGregor. Uh, Marcus, I do have one more question. It's kind of more of a fun uh, question here. Uh, your nickname, I'm very curious about. I've seen that you're listed as the Bama Beast, which is what we've more commonly known you as. But I've also seen that you go by the Chocolate Adonis uh, from time to time. So I'm curious, what will you go into Sweden as, the Bama Beast or the Chocolate Adonis? Well, you know, when I get when I'm in fight mode, I'm the Bama Beast. But you know, after I win, it's time to play. Chocolate Adonis comes out. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how did that? How did Chocolate Adonis come to be? Oh, because you know uh, my body is very is very sculptured, and you know I look <laughs> like a Greek god, but I'm chocolate. So you know that's how it goes. There you go. Awesome. N- Nice. Well, Marcus, uh, we uh, thank you for the time. Sorry for the mix-up earlier, but uh, I definitely want to wish you the best of luck. Have a safe flight. Enjoy the fight. Come back, get that win, and uh, we'll have you back on again. All right, man. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank, thank you. you. Much appreciated. Uh, how much do you guys like that chocolate Adonis thing? He's got the body like a Greek god, and when it's party time, it's all about being the chocolate Adonis. You know, I'm a, I'm a big <laughs> fan of Marcus Brimage, and I think after, first off, we actually, on Wednesday during the show, we had talked a little bit about that card coming up, and that's the one fight that we're really interested in, and that's obviously because of not only Marcus, but because of Conor McGregor and the hype that's behind this guy. Rightfully so. He's got some behind him. But I think the most interesting thing that he said was that the UFC thinks he sucks. I mean, for for him to see... He thinks. He, think, think, yeah, he, he thinks. thinks the the UFC UFC doesn't think. Think. He thinks the UFC thinks that he sucks. Yeah, because which, of that welcome mat kind of, I guess, precedent that they've been putting him under with all these guys that are up and coming. I think that's a, that's a testament to show how tough of a dude he is. I mean, right. look, they've done it to Martin Campman. Martin Campman was the uh, welcome wagon for a lot of guys. Carlos Condit, Jake Shields. Right. I mean, if... And it's pretty much, hey, listen, if you can get if you can get past Marcus Brimage, we know you can fight. Right. You know, that's and, it. And, and I like the fact that not only he's a good fighter, he's a fun dude. So who, who is the guy, okay, and, and I'm so I can't believe I cannot remember his name, but who's the guy from Saturday Night Live who's like, yeah, I drink Cavassier, ladies oh, man. Oh, Christopher Walken no, does no, no, it. No, 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 oh, no. Oh, uh, oh. Um, the ladies man. Yeah, yes, that I would can't be, remember his uh, name. Yes, that would be gross. <laughs> um, when, when he was talking about Chocolate Adonis, it clicked. I'm like, who does he remind me of? I'm like, it's the ladies man. Uh, yes, because if you notice um, my body, it is sculpted like a Greek <laughs> goddess, and it's made of chocolate. It's like a river of flowers. Flowing nest quick that just doesn't nice. stop. Uh, yeah. Oh man! <laughs> well, whoa, um, whoa, whoa, whoa! Settle down over there. Yeah, so the she, featherweight like division. <laughs> here. She, looked, she sounded like she was getting verklempt. <laughs> a little verklempt. Yeah, that was uh, Mike Myers. Yeah, I knew yeah. that one. Copy yeah, talk. I'm, I'm just I'm all over the Saturday Night Live stuff tonight, huh? <laughs> yeah, man. Well, the great thing about having a guy like Marcus Brimage is it really brings the UFC featherweight division picture together. I mean, we have a 
few huge signings this week with fights. UFC 162, Frankie Edgar, Charles Oliveira, also Cub Swanson and Dennis Seaver. You it's know, back you, on. You know what's funny about that one is that it's it's Cub Dennis was was Cub and Seaver was supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. We were juiced about it. Um, you know, Seaver got hurt and then Cub took on uh, Poirier, yeah. of course, on the last UFC on Fuel Card. But the fight I thought they were gonna make because Frankie was calling for it and there was a war of wars. I thought we were gonna get to see a Cub Swanson Frankie Edgar matchup. I'm so excited that we are Dennis Seaver. I've always looked at him and at first the first time I saw him I was like, man, a guy looks like a bowling ball. But then it's kind of appropriate because he just like literally bowls through anybody that he into with he, those strikes like Nam Fam. He looks absolutely amazing at 145. Yeah. The drop was the greatest thing that he could have done. Uh, and Edgar, Charles Oliveira, you know, I do like that fight. Um, you know, it's just really hard to believe that for, we're saying that Frankie Edgar is not fighting for a title. Right. Okay. And yeah. that he's on a three fight losing streak. Wow. It's like and seven he, fights. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, he, he for a title. Seven, his last seven fights were for titles. And this is the first time it's not going to be for a title. But the one fight car, fight on that card that I really liked and I'm really happy it got signed Ricardo Lamas versus the Korean Zombie. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Bad, bad dudes right there. That's going to be a fun fight. Dude, keep your eye on Lamas. If there's anyone in the division that stylistically can pose problems and, and threaten the reign of Jose Aldo, it's this guy. He's a beast on the feet. He's a beast on the mat. And his ground and pound is vicious. It's relentless. He's got the style to knock Jose off his throne. And after looking, what, watching what he did to Eric Koch in the last, I, I'm excited for this fight. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Well, we'll get back to all of that and more. You're listening to the MMA Fight Corner live on Fox Sports in Los Angeles. Vegas and worldwide on ufcradio.com. The MMA Fight Corner. Geico says, let's make life simpler. It's a fact of modern life. Switching isn't easy. Your bank, your cable company, your girlfriend. Let's just say each switch comes with a certain degree of difficulty. But switching to Geico, now that couldn't be easier. First of all, it only takes 15 minutes. And just like that, you could be saving hundreds on car insurance. No muss, no fuss, no irate, vengeful, significant others. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. GEICO presents a thank you letter from your motorcycle. Hi, you dear guy that sits on me. I just wanted to say thanks. Ever since you saved money on your motorcycle insurance with GEICO, we've been going out a lot more. The beach, the mountains, that curvy road that leads to the diner with the milkshakes you love. Look, the point is, you and me... We've become a biker buds, and I like it. I like it a lot. GEICO could help you save on your motorcycle insurance, and that should make you and your bike very happy. Golfers, Club Fest is coming April 6th and 7th to Silverstone Golf Club. Demo all the latest equipment, receive a free round of golf just for attending. Plus, save up to 75% on all merchandise and equipment. It's Club Fest, April 6th and 7th at Silverstone Golf Club. Don't miss it. Real estate. Call me today and sell your house now. 255-1145. Capiche? That's Gavish. Hey, this is Dan the Laptop Man from PC Laptops. You know, the other day I was visiting one of our stores, and I love to pop in and just chat with happy customers. I saw this couple with a huge, massive, giant grin on their faces. They were getting their third PC Laptops computer. They've been PC Laptops customers for almost 20 years. They told me the reason they keep coming back is because they love our lifetime service guarantee. They feel like they can ask any question, and we take the time to be patient and explain everything, no matter what the question is. The best part was they gave me a big, giant hug. And I love giant hugs. Just visit us at any one of our locations and say, show me the love. And you get an extra $100 off any new PC, laptops, desktop, or laptop computer. That's right. Just say, show me the love. And you get an extra $100 off. Check us out at PCLaptops.com. That's PCLaptops.com. At PC Laptops, we really love you. See store for details. Stop. Stop paying too much interest on your title loan. Go to Fast Cash Title Loans, where they're offering a 9.95% rate. While everyone else is paying up to 24% on their title loans, you can get one from Fast Cash Title Loans for only 9.95%. If you have a title loan somewhere else, Fast Cash will go with you to pay it off and get you a new loan at a lower rate. Come into Fast Cash Title Loans today and pay. That's 685 4100. Ortiz, Bad Boy. You listen to the MMA Fight Corner. The MMA Fight Corner. 
Welcome back, everybody, to the Fox Sports Studio. We are MMA Fight Corner, and we are live right now on WorldWideUFCRadio.com. I'm Heidi Fang, and I'm joined by Phil Devine and Joey Varner. Uh, today, guys, we do have a special treat for you. We have a preview of UFC 160's main and co-main event. I had the opportunity to sit down with both former heavyweight champion Junior Dos Santos and Antonio Bigfoot Silva. This interview is ready to go. I'm very excited about JDS to see him face the former K1 champ, Mark Hunt. And also, we have, of course, the title fight with Cain Velasquez against Bigfoot Silva. Here we go, guys. Enjoy the interview. Heidi Fang for MMA Fight Corner. Talking here with Antonio Bigfoot Silva and Junior Dos Santos ahead of their fights at UFC 160. The last time we saw you guys on the same card, it was UFC 146. How excited are you for Cain Velasquez? This is uh, very big for me, very important for my career, for, for my family, you know, because uh, we're going to fight for the title. And uh, I won this title. I want to win this title for, for me, for Brazil, for my fans, and for my family. I remember when you beat Fedor at the Strike Force fights, and you had said that was your biggest moment. How big of a moment will it be if you beat Kane? Will that be bigger than beating Fedor? Every, every fight is a, a, a is a big moment for me. You know, I love uh, uh, my job, and uh, the Fedor is a big, big uh, moment in my career. And uh, now he's a Kane Velasquez, and uh, I don't know exactly. Uh, was the best moment, but now I think it's, uh, it's very, very important. And of course, the last time that you fought Kane, it didn't really go your way. Kane came out the victor. He was coming off a loss to Junior and was looking to regain his uh, title. So this time around, you really will have to uh, make a statement against Kane. What will you do differently this time in the fight? Yeah, this time will be different, you know. Um, the first, with the first fight, I'm very nervous because of my first fight in UFC. I have a lot of adrenaline in my body, and uh, Jukan, my coach Jukan and uh, Katel Kubs give me a uh, strategy, and uh, I don't put the strategy inside the cage. Uh, not, but now I have uh, two more fights in UFC. I got uh, these two fights, uh, good wins, good knockout, and uh, now I'm very, very confident. You've been doing that with your wins over Alistair and Travis. Those are both huge knockouts for you. How do you plan to approach this fight with Kane? What kind of preparation have you done, like maybe wrestling or the ground game? Yeah, I need to train everything. You know, uh, Kane Velas is a tough guy. He's a complete fighter. He fights stand-up. He fights jiu-jitsu, wrestling. But I believe in my hands. My hands, are, every fight make better. And uh, if he gives me any opportunity, I'm going to put my hand on his face. Uh, so the plan going into this is to win, with his, make a statement, knock him out. What do you think about his ground game? Do you think if it gets onto the ground that you can really be able to make some reversals on the ground, do the ground and pound in? Will you try to work that aspect of your game? Yeah, uh, if you put him on the ground, I, I'm gonna, I, I try reverse reverse position. You know, I have a more... Uh, my my legs too big than him. I'm a black belt jiu jitsu and he's not uh, have a good jiu jitsu. He have a good wrestling, he have a good control on the ground, but he not have a good jiu jitsu. You know, and uh, if I have, uh, he put on the ground, I you try to reverse position and use my ground and pound. You're training, of course, at ATT and ahead of the fight with Alistair, you had left the Black Zillions camp and moved on to ATT. How big is it and important of a role to be training at that camp now ahead of this fight? Yeah, when I uh, over in, uh, enjoyed the, the team, the Black City team, I left. Uh, I, I never I never did a part with a uh, Black City team. I just trained with my friends on Black City. And when he, he enjoyed the Black City, I left and uh, back to ATT. All, all camps, I started in Chino Gator in Rio de Janeiro and I finished the camps in the uh, American Top Team. And the American Top Team, I have a good friend, you know. My man is an owner for American Top Team. He's a good family. The guys, uh, I respect the guy, the guy respect me. And uh, I love the American Top Team and Chino Gator. Uh, Junior, of course, you have a little bit of knowledge about Alistair Overeem. It was the second time you were supposed to face him for this fight, and he fell out with an injury. And now you're facing Mark Hunt, a K1 champ, a former K1 champ. How excited are you to face Mark Hunt? And is any part of it frustrating for you to...
Oh, I'm not frustrated to be uh, facing this guy. You know, what I start offering uh, is. Uh... Sorry about that, guys. We had a little bit of technical difficulty. But if you'd like to watch or listen to the full interview, it is on our website, MMAFightCorner.com, and also on YouTube at The MMA Fight Corner. I'm really excited for these fights. I can't wait to see what JDS does against Mark Hunt. And also, hopefully, you know, maybe Bigfoot can put on a performance that isn't a repeat of the last fight he had with Kane. I don't know. What do you guys think? I mean, here, here's the thing. When, you, when you're Bigfoot Silva, you've always got a puncher's chance. Yeah. You always have that ability to land a punch to the chin, the temple, the forehead, the face of your opponent, and separate him from consciousness. That being said, though, A, when you took such a beating, a mauling from a guy in the first fight, that was a big brother beating he took from Kane in the first fight. That wasn't even close. That was just a complete destruction. But then in, in, in the follow-up fight where he took on over him, granted, he did knock out over him, yep. which... Joe Stradamus predicted would happen, by the way, just, just to throw that out there. But um, but he was out-wrestled and held down and controlled by a Dutch kickboxer, a guy who couldn't wrestle his way out of a wet paper bag. And if Overeem is wrestling you and holding you down and dominating you in the ground position, you better believe that Cain Velasquez, fresh off the whooping he gave to Junior Dos Santos, coming back off the whooping he already gave to you once, is going to do it again. Yeah, man. I, good. 100% right there. I mean, the fact that... And it's not even going to be like Alistair laying on top of you for two rounds like that happened. Okay, because that's what happened. Alistair took him down, got him down, and pretty much laid on top of him. That was the definition of lay and pray. Okay, a lot of people, you know, they say lay and pray, and they don't even know what it means. Okay. It means you lay on top of your opponent, and you pray to God the referee doesn't stand you up. And that's what Alistair did for two rounds. All right, then he got knocked out. Kane does not lay and pray. Kane lays and destroys. Okay, that's what he does. Kane, Kane lays a beating he on He does. You. He's a monster. And you're absolutely right. Bigfoot has a puncher's chance in this fight. And Bigfoot looked great against Travis Brown, looked great in that third round against Alistair. Okay, but um, I, I just I see this, you know, like you said, it was a big brother thing. The fight that I'm looking forward to is JDS and Mark Hunt. Yeah, well, when you talk about a puncher's chance, of course, when you're Mark Hunt, you're always in a fight. You always have a puncher's chance. But for me, this fight isn't as exciting or as close as a lot of people think, only because Mark Hunt isn't Mark Hunt that he was in K1. You know, you look at his physique, you look at his conditioning, his cardio. I mean, he gasses. Him and Struve were both fatigued after that first round. Their their output, you know, steadily went down each minute that ticked away off that clock. And, 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 and Joe Nuno Santos is the guy who's who's quick, who's fast, who's light, and, you know, who's explosive at minute one, at minute two, at minute six, at minute eight, at minute 14, you know. So I, I think the conditioning of Junior Dos Santos is going to be the difference maker in this fight. I think he's going to be able to set a pace be too quick, be too in and out for, for Mark Hunt to catch. I mean, I, I'm a big Hunt fan, and I know you can never you know count a good Hunt out, but uh, he's always in the hunt, if you will say. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, I just think, you know, he's going to have to do something about his strength and conditioning, about his physical appearance, um, in order to deal with the speed and power of Junior Dos Santos. Pride never die. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we do have also on that card a great matchup at the light heavyweight division, James Tahuna, Glover Teixeira, I'm really looking forward to that. Glover is such a beast. And I think that if anybody, if there's anybody that has a chance of maybe showing that he is part human and bleeds red, that it could be James Tahuna. It, it could be. Tahuna. Yo, T Tahuna's got some heavy hands. And we saw in his last fight that he can he could take a beat and come back. I mean, that, that shin he took to his chin was like a baseball bat. And a normal human being would have been out cold. 
One thing to keep in mind, though, too, it, it isn't just the, the stand-up war that we're all anticipating, but it's also the Brazilian jiu-jitsu game of Glover Teixeira. You know, Tahuna has looked susceptible in the ground. Gustafson, of course, choking him out, uh, unconscious with, with a rear naked choke. And if Gustafson's landing that choke, and Gustafson is, is, is slick on the ground, but he, I, don't, I do not think he has the same ground game as Glover Teixeira. He's, he's a black belt. I mean, he's really solid, solid black belt. You saw the way he just, you know, transitioned so smoothly against Kyle Kingsbury, hit that, hit that uh, head and arm choke and just put him to sleep with that. Um, so I think on the feet, this is a stand-up war, but I think definitely Glover Teixeira definitely has the advantage when it hits the mat. A lot of people forget that about Glover Teixeira, that he has the ground game. He just mostly chooses not to use it. And what makes yeah. it so scary as well, though, is that Look at his wrestling. I mean, look at his in his last fight. You know the way he uh, against Rampage. The way he out wrestled. Rampage is a great wrestler. Here's a guy that Kevin Randleman couldn't out wrestle. That Rashad Evans had a hard time out wrestling. And Glover Teixeira came out there and out wrestled him. He took him down. He held him down. He controlled him in the top position. So it's not just that he has amazing striking or amazing jiu jitsu, but his wrestling game has come full circle. And now it's a threat in his arsenal as well. Absolutely it is. And tickets are on sale for UFC 160 now. You can visit Ticketmaster.com or head over to the UFC's website. Uh, one topic that really interested me in news today, Joey, and you had mentioned this a little bit earlier, was we were talking about Chris Weidman and that he's holding out on his contract uh, until he fights Anderson Silva in that UFC 162 that's also here July 6th. Uh, he's going to wait to say, he's saying that he's going to beat Silva and then renegotiate. What do you think about that? Is that kind of crazy? Man, that's a risky move. That's, you know, that's rolling the dice. You're either going to build the house or you're going to burn it down. I mean, you know, and, and I'm looking at it, you know, at first when the fight was first announced, I, you know, everyone, myself included, kind of wanted to jump on the Weidman bandwagon because stylistically, you know, it is the nightmare matchup for Anderson Silva. But we've been saying this for day, for, for years. We said this when Dan Henderson fought Anderson Silva. We said this when Chase son and fought Anderson Silva and these are the two of the best wrestlers in the history of mixed martial arts and you look at the the records of Dan Henderson you look at the records of Chael Sonnen and then you look at the record of Chris Weidman aside from beating a, a, an injured and out of shape Mark Munoz and and, and a uh, an exhausted Damian, Damian Maya, Maya you know he doesn't have depth in his record he hasn't faced the challenges or the level of competition that uh, um, Anderson Silva has so I think that's a risky move I think he could have got a lot more money um, you know because what happens is is UFC is like they're a company of they're a play ball company Work with us, we'll work with you. You want to play ball, we're going to play ball. You want to play hardball, we'll play hardball. You know, and I think by taking that stance, it's almost like, you know, I'm going to wait this out until I have the upper hand. And it's, it's a stance that could really come back and bite you in the butt. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I really couldn't. And I understand why Weidman's doing it. Because like you said, stylistically, on paper, he is a nightmare matchup for Anderson Silva. A, a, a guy who can take him down, can pound him out, all right? But... Dude, it's Anderson Silva. Everybody has a chance, they say, against Anderson Silva. Remember when Forrest Griffin fought Anderson Silva? There were a lot of people like, Forrest is the perfect guy to fight Anderson Silva. Going to take him out of that comfort zone. He made Forrest Griffin look like he was walking through mud for a minute and a half. That's what he did. This is Anderson Silva, the greatest fighter on earth. And yes, on paper, it looks like a good fight. But I don't, I, you just, yeah, you got to have the fight. And it reminds me of, like, the greatest show on turf, the Rams, back in, like, 2000. And they were supposed to win it all. And then came along some, uh, uh, some guy that nobody ever heard of, Tom Brady. Okay, now he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Okay, maybe Chris Weidman, in his head, he's looking at, hey, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to win. And then everyone's going to love me and I'm going to get all the money. But, dude, it's Anderson Silva. Well, we'll get back to some more UFC news, guys. Right now, we have to head to a break here and pay some bills. But when we come back, we're going to review some of the top weirdest moments in UFC history. And we also have a little bit of our interview with UFC lightweight Ryan Couture back here on MMA Fight Corner, UFCradio.com, and Fox Sports 920. The MMA Fight Corner. Hi, this is Billy Muir from the MMA Fight Corner Radio Show here on Fox Sports Radio. And I want to tell you about a great gym right here in Vegas that is helping me get into way better shape while teaching me to protect myself like an MMA fighter, even though I have no plans of ever stepping inside the cage. Extreme Couture helps me and plenty of other men, women, and children get into better shape while having a great time in a family atmosphere with coaches leading classes who really care about me. Where else can you go and see world-class athletes like Randy Couture and a host of other UFC fighters training? Nowhere. So whether you're someone who just wants to compete or get in 
shape. Learn boxing, kickboxing, wrestling, grappling, jujitsu. Oh, and I almost forgot, they have great kid classes as well. Extreme Couture is the place for you. No matter what skill level you're at, trust me, I know. It helped me get my butt right back into shape. Call and visit this state-of-the-art facility today. Call 702-616-1022. That number again is 702-616-1022. You'll be glad. Glad you did. I know I this was. This is Josh Rush, Fabier, and you're listening to the MMA Fight Corner. The MMA Fight Corner. Welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner, live from Fox Sports Radio in Las Vegas and worldwide on UFCRadio.com. I'm Heidi Fang, joined by Joey Varner and Phil Devine. And we have a new feature here today on the MMA Fight Corner. We'd like to take a minute to honor the 16 weirdest moments in UFC history. Sorry, that would be bizarre. <laughs> bizarre moments. But, Phil, what do you got here? I know you were into this. You were talking a lot bizarre. with it. Bizarre. Bizarre. <laughs> do, 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 go ahead. Do a walking, Phil. Do a walking saying bizarre. This is totally bizarre. <laughs> I, I don't understand your tone. It's all wrong. <laughs> So, but yeah, no, I I was looking at this at UFC.com yesterday and there's some really good ones on here. Like, and I don't know if this is in particular order that they have it. Um, But the one that they have first is uh, the very first time you got to see UFC on TV. I remember it well. It was a Friday. I think it was a Friday night. First time they showed their pay-per-view. UFC won. It was in Denver. uh, November 12th. 1993, I think, was the date. Well, the very first fight, Gerard Gardeau, okay, he kicked Telly Tuli. Is that how you say his name? Mm-hmm. Telly Tuli. Telly, mm-hmm. Telly Tuli, right in the face, right in the mouth, knocked his tooth into the third row. All oh. right, that was when you were like, okay, this is real. Yeah. This, this is real. This is not pro wrestling. This is real. Well, I thought one of the best parts of that was a couple weeks later, Gerard goes home. He's got this pain in his foot, the infection, just not going away, discoloration. Well, after going to like a third doctor, I think he f- they finally found out that part of Telly's t- uh, tooth was still in his foot. Nice. <laughs> Which I thought was awesome. Uh, they got the Just Bleed guy in there, if you remember <laughs> from um, what UFC was it? UFC... Uh, UFC 100. 15, no, 15. UFC 15, 15. Oh, UFC 15. 15. Okay. Tom Lawler at oh, UFC 100, 100 right. did paid homage to him, yes. but it's, you know, that was the typical UFC fan back then. Um, yeah, just so, just to reiterate, he's the guy who has UFC across his forehead in green and just bleed across his chest in white <laughs> and the camera pans the crowd and here's this guy shirtless going nuts, like literally hulking out with the just bleed all over the place. I mean, he's definitely, he's definitely in the history books. Absolutely. One in here ab- that, that I definitely loved that I still talk about Pete Sell and um, uh, Drago. No, yeah, no, Pete Sell and, and, Scott uh, and, and Scott Smith. Scott Smith getting hit with a gut shot. Looks like he is done, and Sell runs in for the kill and wakes up a couple minutes later not knowing what happened. Landed a nice shot right to the chin. That was one of the most exciting fights I've ever seen and one of the best. Comebacks in the history of combat sports. Absolutely. Uh, and another thing on here, Lawler lets the dogs out. Uh, they left a whole special part for Tom Lawler and him and the stuff that he does, especially during his intros and, and his walkouts, um, weigh-ins. One thing that's not on here, which they show a picture of, but they don't have on there, they show Lawler just as Art Jimerson. I don't know if ever anyone remembers Art Jimison. He was UFC one. I think his very first fight was Hoist Gracie, yep. right? He was the one arm, the one hand boxer. He came out with one boxing glove. One boxing right. glove. He and was actually a legitimate boxer too. He, he certainly was, was. Yeah, certainly was. But we realized right away that boxing gloves were not going to work. No, <laughs> no. Um, UFC one fifty one being canceled on there. I think that's a, that definitely deserves to be put on there. That was a very dark day in history. Um, Randy Couture beating Tim Sylvia, coming back after retirement for the second time, I believe, yep. winning the heavyweight titles on there. Forrest Griffin taking the mic from Tito Ortiz. Uh, I do, I disagree with that one. But I, I do think it was weirder that when you know after that fight, Forrest ran out before the decision was called, and he ran, you know, run yeah, that, that was weirder than so. the taking the mic. I mean, look, the whole situation was weird. <laughs> You know, it was just a bizarre, weird situation from Forrest running out, you know, to running back in, to grabbing the mic, to interviewing Tito himself. It was weird. But is it one of the most bizarre moments in UFC history? Eh, I don't think so. I think Forrest Forrest himself has done more bizarre things than that. 
I'll tell you, my fav- one of my favorite UFC moments is Forrest Griffin, but it's Forrest and the Tito fight number one. When that first fight and when Forrest coming into the third round. Oh, in between the in Hulking between rounds? Up, yeah. yeah, Hulking yeah, up awesome. beforehand. And I, I've had conversations with Forrest about it, and he was like, dude, that was before the second round. I was like, wow, Tito hit you that hard, huh? Because that was the third round. <laughs> <laughs> um, Diaz losing a title fight before the you know mm-hmm. before the fight's even set. He he has the fight set, blows off a press conference, loses his title shot. I think that was one that uh, was definitely a weird moment. Here's one that uh, definitely belonged on there: Caleb Starnes and the Running Man. Oh my gosh! One of the worst. <laughs> it was such an atrocity. <laughs> Caleb Starnes complete spent 15 minutes running away from Nate Quarry. <laughs> Nate Quarry spent uh, the last, I think, three minutes of the fight chasing him, doing the sprinkler, doing the Running Man, nice. doing all types of things. And that was one of the only times that I've ever seen uh, an American fighter go into Canada, into complete hostile territory, get booed like there's no tomorrow. And every fan loved him by the end of that fight. And he even pulled off the Rocky Four speech. <laughs> he even came out there, if, if you could change and I could change. That was fun. Oh, um, here's one. Don't make Big Daddy mad. I, I know exactly. What, um, Gary Goodridge, you remember it well. He We're had Wearing the black gi. The black gi against Paul Herrera at UFC 8. And he had him in a, like, kind of, would you say, a backwards crucifix? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he just elbowed him to unconsciousness. Wow. That was one of those ones where it's like, all right, dude, he was out 20 shots ago. Yeah, <laughs> that was brutal. Um, and one they have on here, who got knocked out first? Carlos Newton or Matt Hughes? Oh, I like that one. That was definitely one. To this day, I'm still not sure. I think Matt Hughes was definitely knocked out, or, or not knocked out, I'm sorry, he was choked out. He and was that, out because I, I don't think he slammed Newton. I think he fell from He kind of he went unconscious from being choked in the triangle. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's mm-hmm. my take. That's my this. take, too. That's yeah. my take when I watched it happen. That's what I thought. Uh, also, everyone out there says Mike Goldberg. They make their complaints about Mike Goldberg. Well, Mike Goldberg may have saved the UFC because the very first UFC announcer, Bill Wallace, former kickboxer. Superfoot Bill Wallace, who if this was around in his day, I guarantee you he'd have been fighting it because this dude could fight for reals. He just can't call a fight. Oh, he certainly can. In fact, actually, it was as UFC 1 is coming onto pay-per-view for the very first time, he announces it as the ultimate fighting challenge. (laughs) <laughs> when we all knew right back then it was actually the Gracie Challenge. But I, I, yeah, right? I, I, think, I think he was a little tongue-in-cheek with that. Um, Jose Aldo celebrating in Brazil. Um, should that be on the list? I am yeah. I thought it was fun, but I saw him do it in the WEC before, so it wasn't the same thing for me. Uh, James Tony getting the wake-up call. All right, That was something we, we had planned on seeing for quite a while. It was the talk. What would happen if a boxer stepped in there with a mixed martial artist with a no rules or a mixed martial arts fight? We saw what happened. We knew what would happen. Um, one, two, th- actually two things on here that I disagree with that should have been on that list. Pete Williams knocking out Mark Coleman. That was awesome. One of the first head kicks we saw, one of the first head kick knockouts in, that we saw land in the UFC was that fight. Yeah, and not only that, it, he still had shoes on. Yes, wearing wrestling shoes. Wearing wrestling shoes. And the one oddest moment in UFC history, in my opinion, Joe San taking repeated groin shots to suffer a loss to, was it Hackney? Keith Hackney. <gasps> Keith Hackney. And we have oh, Hackney. Hackney. Hackney's on the list for slaying the Giant when he fought Emmanuel Yarbrough, which was awesome because he was doing this whole stick and move kind of overhand karate chop. He was open-handed chopping the face of Yarbrough, which is pretty awesome. But I'm come on, man. That's pretty cool. But him throwing 50 unanswered blows to the groin of Joe Son had to be the most bizarre thing you've ever seen in a mixed martial arts fight. It's funny. We were talking about the other day about pride with the four-point uh, rule. I think UFC changed those rules after that fight where no more groin shots were allowed. (laughs) Well, guys, really quickly here, we did promise to play a little bit of our interview that we did have with UFC lightweight Ryan Couture. Uh, We did talk to him about what it's like to don such a famous last name and live up to its expectations. I just want to play that for you here really quick. Ryan, I want to take it back a little bit and talk about your growing up. You know, you're, you're the son of, of Randy Couture, of course. I know you get this a lot, but um, what was it like growing up as having one of the greatest fighters in the history of mixed martial arts as your father? Is this something that kind of motivated you to be a fighter, or at first did it kind of push you away and not necessarily make you want to follow in Pop's footsteps? Um, it, a little bit of both. I mean, it, it made me a huge fan of the sport and, and – gave me a unique perspective on what it was to be a fighter and, and what it took and, and, you know, his, his 
his whole process, what he went through. Um, you know, so I got to see it firsthand and, and see the good and the bad that comes with it. Um, you know, I didn't see myself ever doing it. And, and that was, you know, part of the reason was just having those expectations that I knew would be placed on me because of what he had done. Um, but once I started training and, and just sort of fell in love with it, I, I didn't see any other option. I, I, I was hooked. So, um, you know, I, I think, uh, if, if it wasn't for what, what he did and for, for, being there for his career and becoming such a big fan and kind of falling in love with the sport through that, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. Um, but it also did act as a little bit of a deterrent at the, at the same time. I don't uh, feel any pressure because of it. The only pressure I feel is, is that pressure I put on myself to, to perform to my capabilities. Uh, something that I came to terms with before I ever stepped in the ring as an amateur the first time was that this wasn't the life I was choosing and that I was always going to be, you know, in that shadow and, and talking about it. And, you know, it just motivates me to, to work that much harder to, to sort of build my own resume and my own body of work for people to have more to talk about than just dad. So as, as long as, uh, as long as we're always talking about something I did as well as talking about, about that relationship, then I'm fine with it and I'm doing my job. And guys, that was our interview again with Ryan Couture. You can catch that on our website at MMAFightCorner.com. And just one quick announcement before we wrap up the show. UFC President Dana White announced that the UFC on Fox Sports 1 one card will take place August 17th at the Boston TD Garden. That's going to be pretty awesome. But it is time for us to wrap up things here. I'd like to send a special thanks out to all of the guests that joined us. Ryan Couture, Junior Dos Santos, Bigfoot Silva, Marcus Brimage. Thank you so much for the interview. And again, thanks to Joey and Phil. And we are listening to the MMA Fight Corner live on Fox Sports Studio in Las Vegas and worldwide on UFCRadio.com. Everybody have a great Easter weekend. And remember, tune in Monday at 5 for our next broadcast on UFC Radio.